Hi everyone, uh, this is Vanessa with the Historical Society of Frankfurt. Good to see you all here. Um, just saying a quick hello and please don't hesitate to post comments. We will try and answer them as the show is ending or the lecture rather and um, leave us comments even if you watch after the live stream. Um, thanks so much and we'll see you throughout the show. John, you can go ahead. Uh, sorry. The Historical Society of Frankfurt. And we are tonight celebrating the 300th anniversary of the first Pennsylvania Constitution, which we think is a, a particularly auspicious occasion. Uh, October is Archives Month throughout the United States. States, The National Archives declares that every year and local groups of professional archivists uh, uh, endeavor to uh, put on special programs at their various uh, institutions. Uh, we don't have a professional archivist, but we do the best we can uh, with the wonderful amateurs that uh, maintain our place. And uh, so this year our offering is in fact uh, the uh, anniversary of the Constitution, state Constitution. And that might prove to be the first in a series of annual themed programs in October uh, to try to keep up with Archives Month. Uh, in future years, all of them related in one way or another to the development of the rule of law in Pennsylvania, which we think it's important for people to understand. So our speakers tonight are Debbie Gross and Chip Becker, two, two uh, very impressive uh, local lawyers. Debbie's going to speak. Chip, by the way, is a uh, Frankfurt, uh, grew up in Frankfurt. This is, this is home territory for him, it says. Uh, Debbie's going to speak first. She is a past chancellor of the Philadelphia Bar Association and currently is the executive director of Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts, which is, by the way, how I found out about the uh, 300th anniversary because she put out a notice uh, to her uh, mailing list. So I appreciate that, and I appreciate both of them being here tonight. And uh, with that, Debbie Brooks. Thank you. Are we okay? Can you hear us, or do we mute us? I did not mute oh, us. You did. Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> Hi, I'm Debbie Gross. Thanks for asking us to speak. Uh, I am the uh, CEO of Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts, which was an organ is an organization that was established 35 years ago because of a crisis in confidence in the judiciary. It was originally created um, to support merit selection of appellate court judges in Pennsylvania. 35 years later, we still elect our appellate court judges. So Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts, while still supporting that, I will say has morphed a lot. We feel that if you're going to elect your judges, you should be educated as to what our judges do, what our courts do, and uh, and supports access to justice. So we want to, we do a number of educational programs going out to the community, talking about, you know, navigating the court system, landlord-tenant laws. I was in the car right before I came here talking about protection from abuse. So um, I thank you for inviting me. I have with me Chip Becker, who is a friend and a renowned attorney, even though he'll roll his <laughs> eyes. His, his specialty, while he's at a, um, a, a personal injury firm that you all have heard of named Klein Spector, Chip is an amazing appellate lawyer. And what that means is he, he really has, he has focused on, you know, after, after something happens at the trial level, it goes up to the appellate level and, and, and it could be in state court or in federal court. Uh, and he, he finds fault or finds corrections, I'll say, with, the, with what happens in the lower trial court le uh, level. And 
He has also authored a few chapters in a book on the Supreme Court history. And as John said, this year was is the 300th anniversary of our Supreme Court in Pennsylvania and the um, actually the recently deceased Supreme Court Chief Justice Max Baer uh, organized a celebration of our 300th anniversary. Chip was one of the speakers. We brought in, they brought in, I was not part of this, um, a number of famous judges, uh, including a Supreme Court justice uh, to speak, and as well as judges from different states, different uh, president judges from different states. It was an excellent uh, program. But we're here to talk about Pennsylvania court system. I want to give a little primer. I don't know what you know. You know, our highest court in Pennsylvania is our Supreme Court. Like if you would hear this, use, use the, hear the term New York Supreme Court, that's not their highest court. So Pennsylvania, our highest court is our Supreme Court. It is our ultimate authority in Pennsylvania of law. And we talk about our law in, in our courts in Pennsylvania as, as a triangle. And John has a handout that we will distribute. I also, as an aside, had requested from the courts uh, a brochure that they had produced for the 300th anniversary. Uh, it somehow is in the mail. So it, we will have it for uh, the next um, meeting uh, and, and I'll make sure that John has it to distribute. But again, our court system is a triangle. So our highest courts are our Supreme Court and our, I'm gonna start with our entry level courts. Those are our trial courts. So in Philadelphia, our entry level court, which sometimes uh, can be called the, the people's court, I'll say, is municipal court. If you go outside Philadelphia, it's known as magisterial district court. An easy thing, rule of thumb, is any kind of dispute under $12,000 is seen or heard in our municipal court, you know, our magisterial district court. If you're not happy with the decision, it's appealed to our court of common pleas, which is an entry level court as well for any matters above $12,000, right? Um, the court, I'm, I'm rushing through this because this is not, I just want to give you how we get to our Supreme Court, but this is not the, the, the beef of our conversation, I'll say. You know, our Court of Common Pleas issues decisions, has trials. If you are not happy with the outcome, again, that can be appealed. Every, there is an automatic right of appeal. The court above that, the Superior Court, has to take it. It's, it, it doesn't have discretion to say, I'm not going to hear that appeal. It can, it can deny it but, it, but you absolutely can appeal to that superior court. We also have a Commonwealth court, which I will say has original jurisdiction or appellate jurisdiction. We are the only state in the country, I believe still in maybe one of the states that just enacted a Commonwealth court. I'm trying to remember. I think there's one other state that recently enacted a Commonwealth Court. But our Commonwealth Court, if we may be the only state in the country, it is a court where the a county, um, a, 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 a municipal authority has the right to bring a lawsuit or you're bringing a lawsuit against municipal authority or even against SEPTA. Um, and it's it's a I'll say it's a more business focused court. That's that's not a hundred percent accurate, but it is a more business focused it's, it's court. It's sort of the business of government. Right. Okay. Thank you. So and and they'll list your decision. And and again, if this in if you're not pleased with your superior court or commonwealth court decision, that too can be appealed to our Supreme Court, our tip of the triangle. Now the tip of the triangle has discretion. They can decide whether they want to hear your case or not. They hear very few cases, or they decide to take an appeal, accept the appeal of very few cases. Um, it, it's under about 500 cases a year, I think, maybe a Fewer little. Than that, yeah. Yeah, a few it's hundred, like 300, two, two, two or three hundred three, yeah. Yeah. cases a year, um, and they really take cases that they think could have, um, you know, that 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 will be uh, very influential in the law, I'll say, precedential uh, on the law impacting Pennsylvania. There's many different ways they can get a case. Uh, one, one way is that, for example, if there's a case in federal court and the federal court wants to understand or figure out what the law of the state of Pennsylvania is, they can actually ask the Pennsylvania Supreme Court to rule on a question. 
uh, they could ask a particular question and, the, and the hopefully Pennsylvania Supreme Court will make a decision. Um, it is interesting because I think even in talking to Chief Justice Bear at that conference, the Supreme Court didn't used to respond no. that frequently no. to. There's actually a Frankfurt. There's actually a Frankfurt story. Oh, to, uh, we'll get to that. But there's a bit. If we're going to talk about the certification of of, of of questions of state law, Frankfurt has uh, has a role to play in why it is <laughs> that you can now certify questions of state law. Uh, to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, Interesting. but but please okay. go on. So you know, but but it has the the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania didn't typically take those questions or those certification questions. They have been accepting them much more frequently than in the past. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, J Chief Justice Bear, when I had that conversation with him, said we are more willing to accept them. I don't know what that means. It implying that maybe other judges were not as willing, but that's the the the, the impression I got from. Uh, um, Chief Justice Bear, um, President, Ju no, Chief Justice Bear. Chief Justice, Chief Justice Bear. So um, the other way, an interesting way that a case could get to the Supreme Court is through the, what's known as a King's Bench Power, which we actually just saw. So the governor of Pennsylvania filed a petition for King's Bench Power for the court to decide the constitutionality of a um, of five, I'll say, proposed constitutional amendments that were in a Senate bill that was passed in July. The King's Bench power is unique in that there doesn't have to be a case that has that has worked its way up to the Supreme Court, but the court, but it's a matter that's very important, I'll say, to you know Pennsylvania citizens. So the court could decide that matter by taking the petition, the King's Bench petition. In this case, what happened was the King, the court decided to, I'll say, punt and uh, toss the case back to the Commonwealth Court and said, go to the Commonwealth Court first, follow the proper procedure, and then, you know, we'll see if we'll decide. Um, I think that's a, a, a very quick overview of uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, other than, you know, normal course of action, I will say that the cases work their way up and the court does take it. Um, is there anything else that you think I should uh, have, haven't touched well, upon? Or? Well, I, well I, I have, I, if, if you don't, well, thank you, Debbie. That was, that was a perfect description of the basic structure of the Pennsylvania court system. And as you can imagine, uh, uh, there's a lot of interplay up and down the line between these between these various courts. And if we were interested in, in a full semester law review law school <laughs> class, then we could we could take a deep dive into the uh, into the depths of, of what we call appellate jurisdiction. Um, but but roughly speaking, we do have um, a, a triangle and that triangle structure of general courts of general jurisdiction, uh, uh, which are first level courts designed to hear all kinds of cases at the bottom and then a graduated system of appeals and discretionary review as you make your way up to uh, uh, the supreme judicial authority, what, whatever that judicial authority is called. Um, and in some places, as Debbie was mentioning, it's the Supreme Court. In some places, it's called the Court of Appeals. Um, um, but in, in, every, in every jurisdiction, there is, uh, there is a, 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 a pyramidical, pyramidical, pyramidical structure, a triangle structure, that leads us to that supreme judicial authority. So, um, but I just wanted to touch on on a few of the points that you were you were mentioning. One about the Commonwealth Court, which is an interesting court, right? It seems like a very obscure court to talk about in a setting like this. But one of the things that we are accustomed to when we talk about modern court systems is we're very accustomed to the idea that there is uh, a first level court, which, um, in, generally speaking, where all the cases can go, and and that's and that's where what we think of as trials take place. And then from, generally speaking, the trial court, we then have a series of, we have appeals courts, we have trial courts, we have appellate courts. And sometimes there's, there's multiple layers to that structure, but we're very used to the idea that uh, there's something called a trial court and there's something else that's called an appellate court and they're not the same thing. What's uh, interesting about, the, about Pennsylvania's Commonwealth Court is that it is, it's, it's in fact an amalgam of both. The Commonwealth Court is, is, is generally, as I mentioned earlier, it's a court that focuses on, on governmental uh, uh, questions of governmental law. 
And in fact, the Commonwealth Court is an outgrowth of the Dauphin County. I mean, this is really obscure, but it had to do, with, it, it comes out of the Dauphin County Court of Common Pleas. Dauphin County, of course, being the county that houses Harrisburg. So once upon a time, if you had a question about the power of an administrative agency, you, uh, or a decision of an administrative agency, you would challenge that in, in the county in which the capital is located. And over time, that has become its own independent court. So the Commonwealth Court does have original jurisdiction in some respects, but it has appellate jurisdiction in other respects. And the reason that that is interesting is because while in the 1968 Constitution, that was viewed as a very innovative idea, in fact, it's a very old idea. When we look at uh, uh, English courts from the 15th century, 16th century, 17th century, when we look at the early Pennsylvania courts of the 17th and, and 18th century, the idea that courts would have uh, what we call original jurisdiction in certain matters and appellate jurisdiction in other matters was actually very common. So uh, the interesting side note about the Commonwealth Court, although that really is a whole story unto itself, um, uh, is that the Commonwealth Court, while we think of it as a very new and innovative idea, is in, is in fact hearkening back to something that is as old as the country itself. So that's the one the one thought that I would offer about the Commonwealth Court just as a as a, as a foil against which we can reflect on our own our general assumptions that we have trial courts and appellate courts and they're different. Um, so Debbie also mentioned the concept of certification of state law. And that that is, uh, uh, you know, generally speaking, something that only a professor of federal jurisdiction would love. But um, but it actually is a, it is a procedural tool that actually speaks to something much bigger uh, in terms of how our, com how our country functions. And we are all, uh, you know, very accustomed to the idea that we have uh, a federal government which is a government of limited powers created by a constitution. That constitution was a compact of individual states, which, which retained sovereignty in many respects, but granted sovereignty to the federal government uh, as reflected in the, uh, in the US constitution. And of course, much of the work of the US Supreme Court is, is, is figuring out what is the scope of the power of the United States government under that document ratified by each of the 13, each of the 13 colonies. So, uh, so we do have in our, in our federal republic, in our system of federalism, in this dynamic environment where the federal government has certain powers, state governments have other powers, and they are uh, playing off of each other on, a, on an everyday basis. You know, a, a common question, I mean, questions that we are uh, thinking about today especially in the context of, of who gets to supervise elections. That's something that all of us are going to be reading about in terms of uh, upcoming decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court, is what is the allocation of roles? What's the allocation of power between our state courts, between our states and our, and our federal government? So, so certification, right? We have federal courts. Federal courts are supreme with, with respect to issues of federal law. The United States Supreme Court is supreme <laughs> with respect to questions of federal law. But on matters of state law, purely state law, the federal courts are not supreme at all. The, all the federal courts get to do is to adopt and to reflect on and to apply the law of the states. Now, it, and, and so then the question is, who is supreme as to matters of state law? The answer is the state supreme courts. So we, in our federal republic, we have parallel columns. We have parallel systems. One system is what we call the federal courts, which is supreme as to matter of federal law, and the state court supreme as to matter of questions of state law. So how do these systems talk to each other? How do we have a conversation? Because in a broad sense, that's what federalism is. It's a, it's a method of, of communicating back and forth. It's, a, it's, a, it's an allocation of power. It's a power relationship, but it's also a, it also frames up a conversation. And in our court systems collectively, on our American system of justice, there are ways in which our federal courts and state courts actually talk to each other. So one way is, uh, is something that we're accustomed to. For example, when the Pennsylvania Supreme Court or any state Supreme Court makes a decision of federal law, that question of federal law is subject to review by the US Supreme Court. Many of the cases that are decided by the US Supreme Court are uh, of necessity questions of federal law that come out of states, state courts. Side note, assumption, right? State courts routinely decide questions of federal law. Those decisions, again, reviewable, uh, hopping across from the state line to the, into the federal system, reviewable in the federal Supreme Court. But that conversation can go the other direction, and that's where certification comes into play. Federal courts routinely decide questions of state law. 
but sometimes the federal courts don't quite know what to do or what to think or what the law really is. And so certification is a procedure by which a federal court can ask a state court to decide a question of state law for the benefit of the federal court in the same way that, and it's, there's a slightly different flavor to it, but in the same way that certiorari is the method by which decisions of state courts go to the US Supreme Court, certification is the method by which federal courts can ask state courts what to, what to do. So we have these, we have these words like certification, which, and which, which again, you know, might seem ob ob obscure, but actually uh, in, in a broader sense are ways of illustrating in our, in the context of our federal republic, how our different authorities, how our different sovereigns talk to each other and make decisions because of the competing allocations of power that's embedded into our constitutional system. Um, so then there's one other thing that I want to mention, which is just picking up on Debbie's comments, which is uh, the king's bench power. And the king's bench power is um, is uh, not unique to Pennsylvania, um, but it, Pennsylvania is one of a very small number of courts in which um, there is an ability to file a case directly into the Supreme Court itself. Uh, in fact, the US Supreme Court has certain aspects like that, although it has a slightly different flavor. But so for example, in our US Supreme Court, if two states have a boundary dispute, if two states are having a boundary dispute, think water in the West, right? If two states, well, well, that's not a boundary dispute, but it's a water dispute. But when, when states are fighting with each other, very often those arguments go straight into the US Supreme Court. And what does the US Supreme Court do? They actually hire a special master who makes recommendations and conducts hearings. There's a whole process that the, as to how it has to how it plays out. But in Pennsylvania as well, there is under the rubric of what we call the King's Bench power, the, um, the, the, uh, an opportunity for the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania to act not just as an appellate court, but as uh, in, in essence, a court of, of, um, of first impression. Uh, and this power is reserved for very sensitive, very important issues as the court will call it questions of immediate public importance. And, uh, you know, every lawyer thinks that his or her case is one of immediate public importance. And so often people file King's Bench petitions and then we're all outraged when the court denies them. Um, but that's only because we don't know the full scope of the court's work. And the court, the Supreme Court is a shockingly busy, uh, a shockingly busy court. So they reserve the King's Bench power for, for uh, cases of extraordinary importance where the sense of the court is that there simply isn't time to allow the issue to percolate through uh, the court system in the ordinary course. And there's a merit uh, in the court to speaking in the first instance. It's a risky move for the court because courts often benefit from the percolation of, of fact finding and opinion writing by other judges. But sometimes you have issues that simply can't tolerate that kind of um, uh, um, uh, cooling off period or, 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 or development in the lower courts. So it is, uh, if you can reflect on the word King's Bench, it's in fact a very old power, and it goes to something that we'll we'll talk about a little bit, which is the the origins of of our Pennsylvania Supreme Court in um, in British law, and in fact the King's Bench power comes back goes back to the the King's Court, the King's Bench Court, which was a court of London, um, uh, which was a court of equity in which that power existed. So uh, the our modern Supreme Court with our modern King's bench power uh, is something that, again, we're very accustomed to as, as modern lawyers, but it harkens back to, um, to uh, a, a, an aspect of British legal tradition more than 300 years ago. Um, so uh, Pennsylvania is, uh, you know, if I can come back full circle to the Commonwealth Court, right? Pennsylvania is in some ways jurisprudentially or jurisdictionally in terms of how its institutions, its judicial institutions work in some ways a very modern system, but uh, almost inevitably as we can all, I think, understand, it is a it is a very old system as well, and those those old traditions are still, in some ways, with us. Um, so, with with all of that said, <laughs> uh, and let me say that if anyone has any questions or or thoughts for Debbie or for me, um, I am uh, both of us are happy to try to answer. Um, but with with all of that said, I uh, I think I think the heart of our work today is to think a little bit about the the very early history of our Pennsylvania court system and our, and our Pennsylvania courts. And, um, and I guess before I launch into that, I just want to, and I should have done this at the outset, I want to thank uh, Mr. Buffington and Mr. McKenzie for their hospitality and in inviting me here today. And I just want to note, uh, oh, I said, I, said I, I gave you a teaser earlier that Frankfurt was responsible for certification. And, and, and that is true. Uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court historically was not interested 
in hearing and in, in being asked by the federal courts, please, will you decide this question of state law? Because it's not decided. We're federal courts. We don't really know state law. It would be really nice if you just told us what the law is so that we don't have to guess and predict and then be wrong and be embarrassed. So please, will you just take it? For a long time, the view of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court was not our problem. We have other things to do. They are running an entire court system. They, the, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court is not just the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania in terms of jurisdictional or jurisprudential matters. It actually operates the court system. It supervises the practice of law. It runs and promulgates rules. Uh, it promulgates rules committees or runs rules committees and promulgates rules. It is, uh, it is, it is, a, it is an entire branch of government. So their view historically- It is it, an entire branch of government that has a budget that it goes hand in foot, I'll say our foot in mouth, true. to our legislature to get a budget and hasn't had an increase in its budget in 10 years. But just as an aside, sorry. Yes, all of you should, <laughs> should all call our legislators and demand right. budget increases for the Supreme Court. You will be the first people to call your legislator on that issue, but we all should be doing it. Um, uh, but the, the uh, uh, but in, in the category of Frankfurt in the House, um, uh, I should, and, and Herbert Street in the House, let me let me acknowledge Flora Backer of Herbert Street, <laughs> my mother, and Mr. Mr. Well, Mr. DiGirolamo uh, of, of Ramona Avenue, and I'm sorry, and Paul Sager also of Herbert Street, the 900 block of Herbert Street, and I grew up on the 900 block of Herbert Street. So there is someone else who grew up on the 900 block of Herbert Street. Oh, the even side, excellent point. Um, <laughs> so another person who grew up in the 900 block of Herbert Street was was uh, was my father of blessed memory, Edward Becker, who was a lawyer uh, for the North and Civic Association who practiced with his father, who also lived on Herbert Street, uh, Herman Becker, and uh, who uh, in 1970 became a federal district judge. In 1981 became uh, a judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit and eventually by virtue of seniority rules, became the chief judge of the Third Circuit and used that bully pulpit to pressure the then chief justice of, of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, Ralph Cappy, who, by the way, was not a guy who was easily subject yeah. to pressure. <laughs> but uh, but Judge Becker, Chief Judge Becker, pressured Chief Justice Cappy on the question of certification and said, Ralph, we, you know, I, I know you don't like it, but it's not about what you like. It's, it's just too important. And we need a procedure. We need a way to be able to ask you these questions and for you to decide them. And under under pressure, uh, no doubt relentless pressure. He probably called Cappy every day uh, for, for three weeks until Cappy just gave up. Um, uh, but eventually over time, the Supreme Court did uh, agree to uh, to create a, a certification procedure. So the, the, the presence of certification, which again, to the point that I was making earlier, which we can think of not just as an obscure uh, dimension of appellate jurisdiction, but actually as an important uh, uh, kind of expression of principles of federalism in our in our in our federal constitutional system, uh, uh, that that procedure in Pennsylvania uh, harkens back to uh, uh, to to Frankfurt. So um, that's my that's my that's a very obscure connection between Frankfurt and and that fact. But that is a fact. Do you have a hand? Um, <laughs> Do you have a hand? Is no, there a hand? Way, yes. Oh, no. Yes, ma'am. Um, my own study in Frankfurt, but um, Judge Alan Stern, who was a trustee of this organization, was the first Frankfurtian to be on the Supreme Court. Yeah. Supreme Court. And when was that? Was in the forties. In the forties. So he was scheduled to become Chief Justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, but he died before he was able to. I think he lived in Castor and Silver. You know, only in Frankfurt did right. they know. See, that's typical of my mother, by the way. My mom knows my, mom, my mother. My mother knows my mother knows who used to live in the house. She knows the story of the house. She knows, I mean, it's very funny what my mother knows. We don't have for the okay, so we'll repeat. Okay. Oh, I, I will be happy to. So I'm learning from. I'm sorry, Susan. No. From Gail. And uh, but he was the first 
um, Judge Bob Frankfurt to uh, become a justice of the Pennsylvania. So th th thank you. So we're hearing that Judge uh, Alan Stern uh, was a justice of our Supreme Court. He was from Frankfurt. So Frankfurt is, is, is uh, uh, not only um, can lay claim to a chief judge of the Third Circuit, but also to a justice of our Supreme Court. And, and while while Judge Stern is, is the first justice from Frankfurt, no doubt he will not be the last. Yeah. I'm sure Frankfurt has more justices to offer. Uh, um, yes, sir. Since you talk about the relationship of uh, the federal courts and uh, the state courts and jurisdiction, huh? I'm under the impression, maybe wrong, that there's tension in several states between the legislatures and their Supreme Courts about matters such as the management of elections, redistricting, and so on. Uh, would the federal courts have any role in uh, deciding? Um, well, these are all these are all issues that are going to that that uh, I mean. So the answer is is we'll see. Um, classically speaking, questions of state law are are properly decided um, by by those by those state supreme courts. Sometimes you have a dynamic where where uh, a legislature may want the, the the partisans in you know the a legislature might be a you might have a Democratic legislature and a Republican court if you want to think in those terms. Um, and so um, you know maybe legislators are unhappy or individual legislators are unhappy with what the Supreme Court decides. But um, you know that's that's how our system works. That that questions of law uh, ultimately are 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 put before our courts and our courts apply the the law. So when, as I was mentioning earlier, when we have questions of state law, those uh, matters do ultimately go before the the uh, uh, the state Supreme Court. But um, when those issues have a federal dimension, then sometimes those issues can percolate up into the into the U.S. Supreme Court. And as for tension between branches of government, um, that's the that is, you know in a broad sense is the design of our system of government. That we have we have three different branches of government, and they don't always uh, 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 they don't always agree and with I, each other. I'm going to interrupt Chip and have him start speaking on his topic, but. I also want to say that'll be safe for another point in time because a lot of the conflict between branches of government um, sometimes people think can be cured through constitutional amendments uh, that, that also creates additional um, tension between various branches of government. But I know John's going to look at me and say, we, we're here to discuss the history of the Supreme Court. <laughs> so I'm going to... Put Chip back on All task. Right. Well, it's well, it's a it's a good uh, it's a, it's a it's a good history. I'll just I'll just finish by 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 way of saying that for those of you who are interested in the uh, how election law functions in our society, we've been getting uh, a primer on that issue uh, over the last number of years, where our state supreme court has decided questions concerning state the application of state law, the election code, our federal supreme court. Um, is is deciding questions about the federal constitutional dimensions of of districting, and um, and there are other issues besides that are coming up into the U.S. Supreme Court this term well, that will be that will be germane to this to and, this question. And, all to be all to be uh, it's all all in the stay tuned category. Right, and I mean the Supreme Court just issued a decision today uh, re regarding Pennsylvania voting election law. So right. it's. Um, so the so let me so with, with all of that let me try to uh, I guess come back to the to the very early history of of the or to the dawn of the uh, of our Pennsylvania court system and our Pennsylvania Supreme um, Court. So uh, uh, the the very beginning, if we're going to talk about the beginning of our court system, of course, um, uh, we think of the Supreme Court as founded in 1722 this year as as john buffington was saying this year we did commemorate the 300th anniversary of our pennsylvania supreme court but in fact the pennsylvania supreme court is even older than that the supreme court really harkens back to the early 1680s <coughs> and and that's where the story really begins and that's a story that really begins of course with william penn um, and of course in a sense that's a story of frankfurt as well so uh, there's a lot to say about William Penn. He had an extraordinary life, but for current purposes, we will talk about two aspects of Penn's experience. First, how Penn, William Penn thought 
about the idea of courts based on his experiences in England, and second, what Penn did about courts when he was creating the government in Pennsylvania. So uh, we all know, I think, the bare bones of, of William Penn's story, as, as we all should, um, uh, here in the Frankfurt Historical Society, uh, where, where Frankfurt, as I understand it at least, was a, uh, was a land grant from William Penn to a group of Quaker business people. Um, and I think that's where the name Frankfurt comes from. And I don't know quite that, quite that story, but that's, that's my understanding. Um, is that our, uh, uh, you know, there were, this was, this was Lenape land. And then in the 1650s, the 1660s, you started seeing Swedish people uh, uh, settle in Frankfurt. And it's in the early 1680s mm -hmm. that you have a British, a British presence in Frankfurt secondary to Penn. And of course that British presence is a Quaker presence and, and um, uh, um, thus the occasion for this very building. Um, but we know the bare bones of William Penn's story his father was a famous admiral who was a supporter and creditor of King Charles II. And as a young man in the 1660s, Penn rebelled against his family and expressed a convincement to Quakerism and became a leader of the British Quaker movement, often speaking in public about his beliefs and facing fierce opposition from religious and political establishment. This, of course, reflecting the establishment, the King, the Church of England, uh, as not just a not just a religious institution, but also a political institution. So, uh, so when we think about William Penn, the, often the first thing we think about is his commitment to religious toleration and freedom, uh, as we as we should. Uh, but also because of his experiences as a Quaker, he had occasion, uh, regrettably, he might say, to think a great deal about courts. So, as a Quaker, he experienced English courts where judges worked for the king. Uh, the courts. Um, could therefore represent, as he saw it, as Penn saw it, a persecuting power and an instrument, or, or a, well, an, a persecuting power and a political power rather than an instrument of procedural fairness or substantive justice, which of course is how we at least like to think of our courts today. Um, there is, to this point, the, the very famous and important story of Penn being arrested in 1670 after speaking on a street corner. He was charged with, with certain crimes and that criminal case was tried before a judge, a judge who worked for King Charles II, who refused to identify the crimes Penn purportedly had committed. Um, not only did the judge refuse to identify the crimes, but the judge then ordered the jury to return a guilty verdict on the crimes that had not been identified. Uh, when the jurors refused, the judge imprisoned the jurors and told them that they would return a guilty verdict or starve. So the jurors then uh, uh, sued for their release in an early case concerning the writ of habeas corpus. The writ of habeas corpus referring to the idea of, I mean, literally it says hand over the body or release the body, but, but the, uh, it's the idea of, uh, of, of a writ to, um, to be, in, in this sense, to be released from jail. So the, uh, the jurors did sue for their release, invoking what we now think of uh, as the writ of habeas corpus. And that case called Bushel's case is actually a very important decision in English uh, legal history uh, because the jurors won. And it also illustrates English power, English courts, as William Penn experienced it, again, as a persecuting power, as a violent power, as, as a political power, not an instrument of procedural fairness or substantive, uh, substantive justice. So it is no surprise that as Penn grows into his adulthood as an ardent Quaker, he is convinced not only of the principle of religious freedom, he is also convinced of the importance of juries. Remember, it was a jury that refused to declare him guilty. It was a jury that went to jail with Penn rather than to roll over and do what the, what the, what the judge wanted. He becomes convinced of the importance of juries and jury trial. He becomes convinced of the importance of meaningful access to the courts and, and the right of a remedy through judicial process, like the jurors suing for their release through the writ of habeas corpus. And he also becomes convinced that courts should be independent, at least from the king, uh, so that courts may be neutral institutions that dispense law rather than politics. That's an interesting idea, right? We, we think of courts of law, but actually the idea that courts are in the business of dispensing law is not completely obvious, right? In, 16, in the 1670s, that's not what the British courts were doing. They were instruments of the king's power. So how does all this translate to Pennsylvania? So of course, in 1681, uh, Penn's father having died several years before, King Charles satisfies uh, very large debts 
that he owed to Penn's father by giving Penn title to the vast territory that Penn would call Pennsylvania. Um, and faced with this extraordinary opportunity, and let me say, in terms of how extraordinary this opportunity was, the king made Penn the proprietor of, of Pennsylvania, which is to say that Penn was essentially the king of Pennsylvania. There were certain powers that were reserved for the king himself, but by and large, for purposes of what it meant for Penn to be the proprietor, he for all intents and purposes, virtually for virtually everything that would be meaningful in, in the day-to-day -day life of Pennsylvania, Penn was a king. Um, and faced with this extraordinary power, uh, he did have multiple ambitions. Um, from a values standpoint, certainly he wanted to create a religiously tolerant community that was embracing of Quakers and Swedenborgen and all kinds of people who might want to uh, be released from religious persecution in Britain and Europe. And, and that is how we think of Penn today and was obviously a primary goal for William Penn. But, but how does Penn instrument, how does Penn operationalize a principle of religious toleration? That includes a court system that would, as Penn sees it, represent the best of England's legal traditions. He had experienced the worst of English law. He had been imprisoned without cause uh, simply for his beliefs, simply for speaking on the street corner. Um, and uh, Penn aspires to something better. So his, uh, his commitment to religious toleration subsumes, includes, and encompasses a commitment to, uh, to, to excellence, again, not just in terms of religious toleration, but also excellence in courts. So courts are an expression of Penn's desire to create uh, a society that he views as as valuable from a value standpoint. But courts provide something else for William Penn. They are valuable also because they provide value to his business. Pennsylvania is not just a moral uh, uh, and philosophical uh, project for Penn. It's also a commercial project. He wants people to come to Pennsylvania. He wants people to bring their money, to bring their talents, to bring their families, to build a life, um, to buy land from him. Right, that's how Penn makes money, just like in the category of that's that's how this works, right? Penn is Penn has all this land, and what he wants to do is to sell it off to people who would uh, would come here. So how do you persuade uh, people to build businesses, to buy land, to create a life, to create a community, to create a thriving commercial system? So he understands William Penn does that this business enterprise, yes, it's, a, it's an exercise in religious toleration, but this business enterprise called Pennsylvania only works if people, if Penn will offer a product that people view as a worthwhile risk. So the idea that society will be governed by law as applied by courts is not just a value, it's not just a philosophical principle, it's actually part of the value proposition that Penn is offering potential residents of Pennsylvania in the hopes of encouraging people to come and live here. He wants people to come and have a good experience and feel safe and secure. He wants people to feel that their money and their uh, commercial energy is valued and, um, and, and has an opportunity to grow uh, 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 based upon their effort and their success, but, but, not, but not taken by, um, by arbitrary decisions of, of whoever the king happens to be. He wants people to come and tell others, hey, Pennsylvania is terrific. You should come here too. So we can think of courts as, uh, as, as a method for guaranteeing certain principles of religious liberty, but we can also think of courts as providing a structure through which Pennsylvania will be administered and governed by law rather than politics, law that you can see, law that you can apply, law that you can um, petition for its application rather than the whim of a king. So how does Penn foster courts in Pennsylvania and specifically the Supreme Court? So what Penn first does in 1682, remember he's, he gets, he gets this, uh, this extraordinary thing uh, called Pennsylvania in 1681. And the first thing that Penn does is he creates um, what we now call the, what he called, what we call the frame of government in 1682. And he creates another one in 1683. And roughly speaking, these frames of government um, uh, are what we would think of broadly speaking as a constitution. They're not quite a constitution, um, but, um, but they are 
as Penn put it, they are at least a frame of government. The intention being that this frame of government would be improved by people who are living in Pennsylvania uh, and there would be a deal, essentially a political deal uh, between Penn as the proprietor and the, the General Assembly of, of landowners um, who would uh, ratify this frame of government and that these then will become the operational laws or the, well, not really the laws, but the frame of government through which law would, would, would flow. And each of the frames of government, the 1682 frame and the 1683 frame, um, decide or uh, describe how notionally the judicial power will work. So Penn talks about a couple of things. The judiciary will consist of standing courts that are distinct from the governor or the legislature. That's a really significant idea. Courts are different. Courts are, are I mean, we don't really have in this era the idea of courts as an independent branch of government the way that we think of our courts today. Today we talk about Article I, the legislature, Article II, the executive, Article III, the courts. Each is its own independent branch. Now Penn didn't have that conception and really no one had that conception in the 1680s. But nevertheless, the idea of standing courts that are that have some distinction from the legislature or the governor um, is is an important uh, a, a sort of idea down the road towards what we think of as judicial independence. Another thing that Penn includes in the frames of government: judges can't hold another governmental office. You can't be the governor and a judge. You can't be a legislator and a judge. You can be a judge, but if you're going to be a judge, you can't have any other office. Uh, any other public office. And third, um, and that's something that is all completely obvious to us today, but it was not completely obvious in the 1680s. And third, in the frame of government, judges have life tenure during good behavior. This is also a very powerful idea because remember thinking back to uh, the British courts, those judges served at the pleasure of the king and they worked for the king and they were paid by the king. Um, but here, and, and the, idea of, the idea of judges being paid is actually a story in its own right, but here Penn notionally has these three ideas in his frame of government, um, that the judiciary, that there will be standing courts that have some distinction from the governor or the legislature, that judges don't hold other governmental office, and also the judges have life tenure, and that that life tenure can't, cannot be revoked except for good behavior. These are notional ideas that, that reflect Penn's thinking, and other people were thinking along these lines, but reflect Penn's thinking rooted in his regrettable experiences in London, where he experienced courts as persecuting in political powers, not as places of procedural fairness and substantive justice. Um, so uh, in 1684, Penn having uh, written these frames of government in 1682 and 1683, um, uh, Penn, uh, along with the provincial council, enacts a judicial act. I mean, the frames of government are notional. Now we actually have a statute. Um, because it's, it's really in 1684 that Penn and the, the Provincial Council are able to get together and really pass things and agree as to what the, the structure of Pennsylvania government and law is gonna look like. So one of those initial acts is the, is the Judiciary Act of 1684. And that's the first uh, uh, effort that we see in Pennsylvania to create what we would call today a unified judicial system. Um, there are justices of the peace who are roughly speaking, um, I mean, you know, real local judges there are county courts uh, and no doubt rights of appeal from the justices of the peace to the county courts, although they probably also had separate uh, uh, areas of original jurisdiction. And in addition to the justices of the peace and the county courts, there was a statewide provincial court, statewide provincial court created in 1684. Uh, the provincial court, this is to the point that I was making earlier about the Commonwealth Court, had original jurisdiction. This is a statewide provincial court had original jurisdiction in certain kinds of criminal, civil, and equity matters, but it also had statewide appellate jurisdiction from the county courts. It was not a true final court in the way that we think of the Supreme Court today because there was uh, a reserved appellate jurisdiction in, in English courts. Certain big money, really big ticket cases could be further appealed to the King's courts in London, but by and large, the Supreme Court was the final appellate court in most cases except that also like our Commonwealth Court, it had original jurisdiction in certain other cases. Um, so this provincial court represents the establishment, um, uh, the first establishment, frankly, anywhere in the United States of a statewide appellate court. Well, I should, I'll amend that statement in a moment, but I'll just go with it for now. A statewide appellate court capable of uh, organizing and developing a body of Pennsylvania law on a Pennsylvania wide basis. 
And interestingly, colloquially, the provincial court is called the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Its official name is the provincial court, but a uh, provincial court, but, called, but, but casually it's called the Supreme Court. Now that institution, the Supreme Court, is relaunched and rebranded in May 1722 uh, as the official Supreme Court of Pennsylvania by virtue of, of a statutory enactment, by virtue of another judicial judiciary act uh, passed by the General Assembly. And that is an important um, story in its own right. And it is, it is actually correct to say in, in very um, uh, proper terms that our Supreme Court was founded in May 1722. But the Supreme Court's antecedents actually lay uh, with the provincial court created by William Penn in 1684. Um, and that dating is why the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, if we view it together with the provincial court, is in fact the oldest continuously operating appellate court in the United States. Um, older even than the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, which was founded in 1688. And if you happen to be speaking to someone from Massachusetts, <laughs> what you can say to them is that the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts is the oldest uh, is the oldest statutory court in the United States, um, uh, and and has had the name Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts since roughly since 1688. So. Uh, in, in terms of those narrow statutory terms, the Supreme Judicial Court of, of Massachusetts is, in that sense, the oldest continuously operating appellate court. But because our Supreme Court, although statutorily created in 1722, has its antecedents back with William Penn in 1684, it does, broadly speaking, uh, um, have, have the, I think, fairly have the moniker of the oldest continuously operating uh, appellate court in um, not just the uh, United States, but actually the Western Hemisphere. Um, uh, so uh, let me just say a few more words about Penn, and then let me say a few words about the formation of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania itself, and then I'll um, happily open this to any questions that you may have. But I'm just going to summarize with Penn. Penn implants important seeds uh, in the soil of Pennsylvania. Law as an organizing principle of society, not royalty or might, uh, but law will dictate society's progress. This is a powerful idea. It is not obvious, but it is the central uh, principle that Penn uh, offers. He's offering it from the prism and for the purpose uh, of, uh, from the landscape of, he's offering it through the prism of, of, of his religious persecution and for the purpose of creating a society that is religiously tolerant. But the mechanism, the mechanism for uh, moving society from uh, a society that he perceives as cruel to a society that he perceives as fair and autonomous is law, law, not politics. And the instrument of law is courts. Um, now, it would take 100 years uh, for our concept of courts to emerge into something that we recognize today, judicial independence, in the sense of judges having uh, life tenure, good behavior, they can't be removed except by impeachment. In Pennsylvania, there's a wobble as people go back and forth in terms of how they think about uh, the kinds of autonomy that judges um, uh, really have. It's, it's 100 years before we are comfortable with the idea that judges should be paid, right? Um, this is, it's 100 years, uh, 100 years or more before we think of judges having the power of judicial review, having the power to review um, statutes and to overturn them, to avoid them if they are uh, beyond constitutional parameters. So the evolution of our concept of what it is that courts do and how it is that courts function and the, the principles that guarantee judicial independence, that is a long story. But it does, it does really start uh, in a powerful way with William Penn, not just in Pennsylvania, um, uh, but Pennsylvania leading, leading the country. So uh, just a few more words then on how we get from the provincial courts of 1684 to the Supreme Court of 1722. And um, the points that I wanna talk about here are the concepts that history is incremental, it's unpredictable, and there and sometimes needs to be luck. So the first word that I wanna talk about is incremental. I'm sorry. Oh, um, it, so uh, incrementalism. Penn brought courts, Penn brought an English concept of courts to Pennsylvania, but he did not create courts. The, the Swedes and the Dutch were here before the British, um, and the Swedes and the Dutch brought their courts with them. The Swedes 
came in the 1630s, the Dutch came in the 1660s. So at the point that William Penn landed in, 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 in Pennsylvania, there actually were courts um, here, uh, very, very highly localized courts built along Swedish and Dutch lines. And part of what Penn was doing in the 1684 and the Provincial Council were doing in the 1684 Judiciary Act and in a series of Judiciary Acts that followed was to try to rationalize those courts uh, along, along the lines of, of British law and what I might even call Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania law. That is a, that is a many decade process in its own right as uh, as Pennsylvanians figure out how to uh, understand the various um, legal and jurisprudential traditions um, and integrate them into something that we can recognize today as what we will call Pennsylvania law rather than British, Swedish, or Dutch law. So, um, uh, so that's incrementalism. Even, even when Penn first lands, he is not uh, he, he's not operating on a blank slate. Um, then I mentioned the word unpredictable. Uh, Pennsylvania politics in the 1680s through, you know, and really through the revolutionary period and beyond um, was fractious and raucous. And of course, in some, I mean, it still is fractious and raucous, but it was no less fractious and raucous. And in those times, um, there were religious, regional and political turmoils turmoil. The Quakers feuded with the Anglicans, they feuded with the Presbyterians, the Presbyterians feuded with other people, the lower parts of the colony feuded with the upper parts of the colony, the eastern counties feuded with the western counties, right? There were lots of different factions um, that, that played out across the Commonwealth, or what we now think of as the Commonwealth and the colony of Pennsylvania. One of the central feuds, one of the central tensions in Pennsylvania uh, during this period of time was between the colonists and the proprietor. And I mentioned earlier that Penn wasn't just Penn wasn't just given land by the king. He was made the proprietor of this of this uh, of this land. Bear in mind, Pennsylvania is forty six thousand square miles. I mean, just think about you. Your dad gave the king some money. The king can't pay it back, so he gives you forty six thousand square miles. Right? That's what that's what William Penn had, um, and he was given it free and clear, and he was given it in a manner where he was essentially the king, and it was hereditary. So Penn, the proprietorship passed from kings, from Penn to Penn's kids. And I'll just say briefly, and you all know this, that didn't actually go that well um, as far as the colonists were concerned. And a central debate in Pennsylvania, a central tension was, uh, was, was the kinds of, was the autonomy that the colonists had relative to the proprietor. So you have pro-proprietor forces who are who are generally the wealthier forces in society, who are the landowning forces who are politically and culturally and otherwise aligned with the Penn family, um, who of course want the Pens to have maximal power. And then you have all of the other people who are living across this 46,000 square mile community who have different views uh, and want autonomy. So that tension between local control and, and centralized control is a central tension in, in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and one of the ways in which we see that feud playing out is in who would create courts. Um, courts, as we have discussed, are trappings of civilization. They are trappings of power, right? And insofar as courts are instruments of law and law is a method for determining or uh, sort of making the rules around, around commerce, courts are instruments of power, uh, not just in a very general sense, but, but really get to dictate who has the money. So who gets to create the courts and uh, is, is a very important um, question. It's a proxy for this larger battle between uh, local autonomous control and, 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 and really on one hand and central control through the Penn family on the other. That's why the assembly voted down the 1682 frame of government, which never became law. That's why uh, Penn had to, had to go through tough negotiations with the provincial assembly in 1684 to create the judicial uh, the Judiciary Act. Um, uh, that's why the initial justices of the private of the of the provincial court had to ride circuit. One of the deals was, if 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 Penn is going to get a Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, those justices have to go all over the place. They have to bring law to the local community. The local community doesn't come to Penn. Penn has to send his judges to the local communities. These are all political questions, uh, political deals that are being that are being worked out. Um, so, but there's another player in all of this, which is the crown. Uh, Penn and the colonists are struggling to figure out their balance of power, but the crown, although the crown has given Penn this land, this land the crown has a reserved right as well. 
And the way that the grant of power to Penn worked was that statutes passed by the provincial uh, assembly, um, uh, approved by Penn, had to go for ultimate approval, or I should say a veto, had, were subject to a veto by the crown. And so what was happening in the, uh, in the late 1600s and early 1700s was that Penn and the provincial assemblies were going through a series of tough negotiations to create these judiciary acts. The judiciary acts were creating local courts, which would uh, create bodies of Pennsylvania law, Pennsylvania institution, build up the Pennsylvania government, and in so doing, create more separation from, from, from the crown. And so what the crown was doing actually was vetoing these judiciary acts. The judiciary acts were viewed as potent um, symbols of the way in which even as, even as Penn was fighting with the colonists, on, uh, with, in, in, where there were intra-Pennsylvania squabbles between Penn and the colonists, as between Penn and the colonists and the crown, there was another dynamic, which is the crown trying to hold on for dear life to the thing that had given it away, that it had given away. And vetoing judiciary acts was a way that the crown was maintaining control over Pennsylvania, because as long as the crown vetoed the judiciary acts, people would still have to go to England to get final decisions, final exercises of power with respect to questions of law. So there are a series of judiciary acts that uh, are passed by the provincial assembly that are uh, sent to London and London vetoes them. What then happens in, and this is luck, what then happens in 1722 is that the provincial, the provincial assembly passes another judiciary act. It's approved by the Penn family. It's sent to London and what happens in London? It gets lost. It is literally uh, put on a table and something is put on top of it. Oh. everything up. I didn't do it. <laughs> There's my piece of paper. <laughs> Something is put on top of it and it's forgotten about. It is forgotten about. And that was actually dramatic. Um, uh, and for good five and for five jury. and for five years, <laughs> this piece of paper is left on a desk and it's underneath something else. The crown has five years in which to veto a judiciary act. And more than five years later, it's finally discovered and, the, and it's too late. And thus, and, and that 1722 uh, uh, Judiciary Act is what created the, the modern, what we now call the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Um, and again, even though the Supreme Court and, and this, the, the, there's, and, and the story goes on from there in terms of, in terms of how the Supreme Court uh, uh, unfolds. Um, uh, but because in fact, there's a 1727 Judiciary Act, which the Crown vetoes, which actually restores the 1722 Judiciary Act. So there's a whole, there's a whole story of statutes and vetoes. Um, but the, the, uh, but the, the incrementalism, the unpredictability, the, you know, the just sheer luck, which we see uh, as, you know, the part of the story of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania is in a sense, uh, in a sense, you know, something that's typical in all of history. You can, you can read the story going backwards, but but as the thing was unfolding, none of it really, people didn't really know what, what they were doing. And certainly in 1722, people did not understand that they were creating a, a court that um, 300 years later would, would be a supreme judicial authority in the way that we understand it today, not a group of five judges riding circuit with no home, no pay, the ability to be fired essentially at any time, but in fact, a supreme, a truly supreme judicial authority uh, of, a, of, of a commonwealth of 13 million people um, running uh, a, a, a gigantic branch of government that uh, whose decisions um, touch every part of of our of our lives. I think it sounds like a good sequel uh, for Lynn Emanuel. Uh, if he wants you know, to do maybe it, maybe you should write to him. If not, I'll, I'll, I'll call Lynn. <laughs> I'll call Lynn and tell him to do it. So, uh, so I'll just close and say that's uh, that's the very early history of our Supreme Court. It starts with William Penn. Um, it starts with the the interplay between Penn and his provincial council. Uh, the king gets involved. We see the provincial courts. We see the, uh, uh, the the gradual development of the Supreme Court. And again, it's truly it's truly a hundred years or more before we start to recognize courts as something that we as, as it's a hundred years or more before the courts evolve into something that we recognize today. An independent branch of government, tenure uh, for good behavior. You can only be removed upon impeachment. You have a salary. Right, rights of judicial review, the modern features of the modern judiciary um, uh, are, are a long time in evolving, but they have their roots 
uh, in Pennsylvania and through Pennsylvania in the entire in the entire country in the story that I'm I'm trying to tell you today. So I could go on for another hour, but I will stop here. And um, <laughs> hopefully, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'm going to be here in case uh, we have questions to be repeated. Uh, is it the questions from the live audience? No? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm still uh, interested in the matter of uh, the, the relations between the branches of government. Um, isn't there an argument to be made that the the supremacy of the courts as uh, is or court judicial activism is getting somewhat out of hand. I mean, it, it, we talk about three co-equal branches of government, but as a matter of fact, they're not co-equal. Congress obviously is superior in the federal system. And uh, from what I gather in most state constitutions, the state legislators are superior. So, um, you remember my first question was about the disputes, outrage on the part of legislators, not just people who disagree, a few, a few people who are of an opposite party and disagree with the courts, but an actual, you know, structural, theoretical disagreement about the roles of the legislators uh, versus the judiciary. Are you satisfied that the judiciary is uh, in its proper place? Uh, do, you, do you want the one word answer? <laughs> the one word answer is yes. Oh, sorry. The one word answer is yes. Our, our courts, both federal and uh, state, generally speaking, uh, do exactly what it is that they are designed to do, which is apply, uh, interpret and apply our, our law. Now, some of those laws are, are, are laws about which people care very deeply, um, but nevertheless, the work of the court is to, is to, apply, uh, is to apply the law relative to the facts against the backdrop of the arguments of the parties. And, and that is something that I, uh, that, that in my observation, as someone who has practiced law in our state and federal courts in a variety of, of topics and in a variety, uh, in, a, in a variety of, of areas of law and in a variety of professional settings has observed. I, I think that our federal courts and our state courts, different kinds of people, different kinds of selection systems, but by and large, uh, my, my observation and experience is that uh, our courts are highly professional and do uh, a very good job of, of staying in the lane of what it is that judiciaries have to do. Um, uh, now, as to activism, I will say that judicial activism is, is a word that uh, tends to be in the eye of the beholder. Um, it, is not, it is not a legal term. Uh, it does not, uh, in, in my observation, um, uh, provide a very useful way of, of describing um, the, the nature or the internal structure of a judicial decision. And uh, it is a word that is liberally, and I think often unfairly, um, uh, used to, uh, to, to criticize on both sides, by the way, on both sides, decisions with which people are unhappy. I have seen, quote unquote, liberals you know, talk about judicial activism with respect to decisions that people think of as conservative. I have heard, uh, I've heard conservatives talk about judicial activism with respect to decisions that they think of as liberal. Um, the, the, the characterizations are not useful. What is useful is looking at the decisions, reading the opinions from the standpoint of the law, the procedural context, the arguments of the parties, and the applicable facts. And while you know, there are, you know, sometimes reasonable people can disagree. We, I mean, this is why we have seven justices or nine justices on, on our Supreme Courts. Um, uh, you know, the, their law is not an exercise in, in physical mechanics um, and different points of view sometimes shape decisions and people reach different decisions. But, uh, but judicial activism is a, is a highly nonspecific way in my experience of for people to um, express disapproval with 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 the decision just on its you know on a perception of what the decision actually is. Now, can uh, uh, there are certain areas where our courts there are certain areas of law which are most sensitive, which are very sensitive, and they can relate to the uh, the the what we call commonly called separation of powers, but the dynamic interplay between systems of government. Um, we. Uh, 
are seeing that. We see this routinely. We will see this uh, this term in the U.S. Supreme Court in Atlanta election cases. These issues are not new. Um, they are difficult. They go back to the dawn of the republic. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how how it all plays out. But but coming back to you know my my first observation, if the question is how do I think our courts are doing in terms of taking on the tough legal questions that are posed with them and responding to those questions in the terms in which they are brought, I think generally speaking, um, uh, and and listen, there are decisions of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania that I'm not happy with, or I might. To, you know, decide differently if I were a justice, who knows? There are decisions with the U.S. Supreme Court that I might say, well, maybe I would decide that differently. I mean, it's, it's very easy to, you know, after the fact to say, well, I would have done differently. But judges don't work um, backwards. They work going forwards. They read briefs. They look at arguments. They look at procedural posture. They look at facts. They look at arguments. And my general experience is that while there is a diversity of views that judges may have, on questions. That's why we have majority opinions and dissenting opinions and concurrences. That's part of the, the fractiousness. That's part of the conversation that is that is uh, integral to our, our jurisprudential culture. But, uh, but, but that all of the judges that I have encountered, and I've encountered a lot of judges, take very seriously, very seriously the idea that their work is is not is fundamentally not legislative it is not in the nature of policy it is in the nature of operationalizing and applying principles of law and we have a country where law you know tough questions are organized as legal questions and which courts decide uh, issues about which people care intensely but if you read the opinions what you will see and this harkens back to william penn what you will see is not politics what you will see, generally speaking, is law. Yes, sir, Mr. Gigerolamo. When the English Crown lost the power over the courts in uh, the United States, mm -hmm. did anything happen to the person that lost it? They didn't hang or anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there, the... the no, I don't. Well, so in in you know the in, in in Pennsylvania, if we want to think about some of our early chief justices, our 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 first chief justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court was David Lloyd, and David Lloyd was an anti-proprietor guy. So David Lloyd's issue was he cared about the people, not about the pens. So that was David Lloyd's issue, and and David Lloyd was a great figure in terms of cultivating a body of Pennsylvania law and also cultivating the independence of the Pennsylvania courts as against the pens and as against the as against the crown but nobody was hanged now the guy who succeeded David Lloyd was actually Charles Allen Charles Allen was a pro proprietor guy he he was he was a very wealthy guy in fact Charles Allen is 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 the person who founded Allentown Pennsylvania Charles Allen's estate by the way um, from living in Northwest Philadelphia was Mount Airy. And, uh, and I used to live in the Mount Airy section of Philadelphia. And in fact, I lived on Allen's Lane. I no longer do, but Allen's Lane refers to, to Charles Allen. So Charles Allen was a pro-proprietor guy, but even Charles Allen um, uh, worked on cultivating the independence of the Pennsylvania courts, ultimately as against, as against uh, not really as against the Penn family, but, but believed and did cultivate the, the, the institution of the Pennsylvania in the Pennsylvania courts, but nobody got hung under his supervision uh, either. Charles Allen, however, was not only a pro-proprietor, he was also um, really a loyalist. And when the Revolutionary War, which was a you know truly violent war, I think much more so than we we realize, it was a true revolution. Um, Charles Allen eventually receded to a kind of neutrality um, during during the Revolutionary War. And I think that those who who really understand the Revolutionary War will appreciate that it was not it's not just about the Battle of Bunker Hill and and Rochambeau uh, and, and Yorktown, but that it was a real revolution. It was a, it was a violent. Uh, um, tension or uh, 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 there, there was violence, um, not just between the armies, but at all levels of American society around, uh, as between those who were broadly speaking committed to the crown and those who, who were committed to, uh, to independence. So no doubt during the Revolutionary War and, and in the period thereafter, we see uh, a sharpening of the battle lines and people who are either with us or against us. But during that early history of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, not just the area, the, not just the period of the provincial court, but from 1722 to 1776, um, the work of that court is 
is establishing a body of Pennsylvania law and the Pennsylvania institution as distinct from Britain. There is another chapter of the Supreme Court, which I haven't, which I'm not going to talk about, which, which is, which is about not just the transition from being British to being Pennsylvanian, but from being a Pennsylvanian to being an American. And that, that work of going from thinking of ourselves as Pennsylvanians to thinking of ourselves as Americans, as distinct from being British, that, that is a, that is an important story and, and regrettably uh, also a violent story. But not one that I think involves hangings in relation to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. <laughs> Maybe I think Judge I, I think Judge New might have wanted to hang me once or twice. Um, but, <laughs> I had that same feeling once. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, one for for Debbie, please, as as a former chancellor uh, of the Philadelphia Bar Association. Uh, do you find it aggravating that the uh, Bar Association's uh, reviews of uh, judicial candidates get so little mm. attention from the public? That's a great question. Ironically, I'm on a committee right now uh, that is reviewing a candidate. I had six calls for references today. So yes, it's getting better. Um, for uh, because we we've done studies actually the bar association has done studies and knows that when uh, we we went to certain polling places and and really spread the word about the judicial the bar association's review of candidates and who are recommended and not recommended it does make an, a difference but I think what's most frustrating right is that during odd numbered years where judicial elections occur, so few people turn mm -hmm. out. So in um, 2021, 2021, yes, there were only 2 million Pennsylvanians who came to vote for judicial elections and other elections, whereas in you know 2020, we had almost 9 million people come vote. So for some for positions that could have such an impact on our everyday lives, right? Because most cases re that impact us really occur in state courts as opposed to federal courts. Um, you know, the decisions made by a very small percentage of our population. Mm -hmm. um, as a as a side note about decisions made by our state courts, each year in our state, each year in our federal courts, there are about four hundred thousand cases that are filed. 350 to 400,000 cases filed each year in our federal courts. In our state courts across the country, that number is over 84 million. Did Pennsylvania adopt the English common law wholesale when uh, it became uh, a state? Uh, and if so, how much of the uh, corpus of the English common law is, is still in place, if it? Um, so, uh, it did, I mean, the English common law principles, um, are, are, are very much part of, of our Pennsylvania legal tradition. I, I don't know that anyone would have said that Pennsylvania quote unquote adopted the English common law, but the English common law tradition certainly came over the boat, uh, along, along with all of those, along, along with William Penn and, 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 and the British. Um, but again, there were Swedish legal principles, there were Dutch legal principles, there were perhaps even uh, um, um, Native American legal principles that were in play in some part of, in some parts of our of our Commonwealth. So, uh, uh, but but certainly we we do have, um, in terms of our legal institutions and our common law, a very deep tradition in um, in England. Now that said. Part of what's happening, and I mentioned David Lloyd and William Allen, part of what David Allen and William Lloyd are doing is, is, re, is, is redefining English common law principles as Pennsylvania law. Yes, yes, these, these principles, this methodology for law uh, harkens back to Great Britain, but, um, but the process of deciding who's gonna be a lawyer, the idea that lawyers have to go to school what kind of school do they have to go to, that they have to take an examination in order to become lawyers at the Pennsylvania bar. Um, the idea of, of dockets, ways of recording what happens in cases and making them publicly available, books that record legal decisions. Those, those books are recorded and described not as British legal traditions, 
as British law. Those are those that's Pennsylvania law, right? So what we see in the 17 in the 1680s through the through the you know a hundred year a hundred year and hundred year and, and more following is the gradual uh, evolution of a British legal system and British legal principles into something that we don't recognize or call as British law, but something that we recognize and call Pennsylvania law. And that story of that story of how of first we were British and then we became Pennsylvanians. That story that is, well, I don't what I was going to say is that story is the story of the Supreme Court. But I think the better way of saying that is the story of the Supreme Court is, is a chapter of that story, right? The, the development of a provincial court and eventually the establishment of a quote unquote Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. The provincial court <coughs> it hails from Penn and Penn gets his power from the king. But the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania was enacted by the General Assembly of Pennsylvania, right? The, the nomenclature is similar. The institution is similar, but who created it and how it was created and who's responsible for it and what it means in our society, those things are gradually evolving. And, uh, and, and so I think the point that I would make again is, 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 is that yes, the British law comes into Pennsylvania law, but what's really important is how we recalibrate it and re-express it in the context of our Pennsylvania, uh, of our Pennsylvania institutions. And that story is ongoing because when we think of our federal constitution, that federal constitution is a compact of 13 states. So before, before we could create America, before we could create the United States, we had to create the states. We had to create the colonies. We had to create a state culture, what we think of today as a state culture and that project of first we were British and then we were Pennsylvanians. First we were British and then we were Virginians. First we were British and then we were Massachusetts, Massachusettsians, if, if that's a word. That progression is, is foundational to the progression that leads to the formation of the country itself uh, so that we have Pennsylvania law, yes, and then eventually, of course, we have, we have American law um, uh, and, and, and federal law, and one is building on top of, one, one is building on top of the other. Any other questions from the in-person audience? It would be wonderful if the two of you could get back up here uh, on the occasion of our March meeting, when our speaker is going to be uh, the recently retired curator of Pensbury Manor, uh, who has made himself quite an expert in the details of the run-up <coughs> to the issuance of the uh, uh, charter, his charter. And uh, he, he has a somewhat counter-cultural view uh, as a historian uh, concerning some of those details, some of which you mentioned. <laughs> and uh, you will find, I think, his talk uh, very interesting. Of course, you can watch it remotely if you must, but we'd love to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. Participating uh, personally in that. And uh, so that's the second week of March, second Tuesday of March, 7.30 as, uh, as usual. And uh, our November meeting will be uh, concerned and be very church, the Sweden board meeting church that was, uh, was mentioned. No, it's December. Oh, that's December. Okay, our December, sorry. Our December meeting is the, is the Sweden board church that was, was mentioned today. Um, Okay. Uh, so with that, uh, we hope you'll join us again every every uh, every month. Uh, the the cold months, uh, not the two cold months and the two hot months, uh, on the second Tuesday. And uh, we love to uh, expand our November's the uh, anniversary of the L. Oh yes, that's right. The L. Anniversary falls in November, <laughs> and uh, we have a speaker who's bringing out a book on the history of the Belgium of Yale in honor of its uh, centennial. And uh, he's also going to talk about some of the preceding uh, rail lines through the uh, country. Thank you, John Hewitt. Uh,
think that's all I need to cover. So thank you uh, all for coming. And for those of you who were here, uh, you were you. you oh, 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 no. Archives Month Philly. Archives Month Philly. Dot com. It will well repay checking out the website and seeing if there are some, some events that you can uh, work in your busy schedules. Uh, that's, that goes for everybody that's in the uh, Philadelphia region. People elsewhere in the country uh, might want to figure out uh, what's going on in their particular regions, too. But Archives Month Philly, I can't uh, recommend it too highly. So, uh, and we will hope to see you next month. <laughs> So thank you for coming. That <laughs> was great. It was really great. Do you think the election should be moved to the evening years? I do. It should be. Yeah, because you can't have it should you can't have twenty percent of the population voting for judges. I mean you want elections and do it right. That's how I look at it.